That book, My Thomas, oh, I see. So you wrote that when you didn't realize you were channeling. No, I, I wrote the first draft in like 1990. And he tells me now that, that he, he, Thomas, uh, I mean, uh, Jesus led the group that did A Course in Miracles. They thought, okay, uh, this is going to be a restatement of the Gospels, because he's been trying to fix Christianity for a long time. Yeah. So he wrote A Course in I Miracles, know. or the group, the group did. And uh, then it quickly, we, they realized it went right over everybody's head. It's very valuable, but very few people can do it. Yeah. So then he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a new revelation that's exactly the same as my old revelation. And that was decided in the 80s. And they, he wanted someone who had never, you know, wasn't a channel, had never, was not known to be a channel. So Thomas, bless his little heart, recommended me. And, but they didn't know if I could channel because I hadn't started working with Thomas yet. So he guided me through researching that book and writing that book, which to me is astonishing. Here's a man who was so private, he burned all his wife's letters. He never wrote a personal memoir. So then, you know, 100 years after he dies, he um, writes a memoir through me. But that's what it is. It's Tom, my Thomas is a memoir of Thomas Jefferson's life during the Revolutionary War. It's the best thing I'll ever write because I didn't write it and it's very good. Mm. So when you were writing at the time, you were researching him and you just thought the information you were putting in was Judaism. Yes, I, but I realized in retrospect that was stupid. But I mean, I sat down at the typewriter, because our computer was a much more primitive computer then, and um, the words just started flowing. Mm -hmm. And I very, I mean, the scenes, it all came to life. And I can, and then I would look at what I, I wonder where, how I knew that. Oh, I'm sure I got it out of my research and I would just keep going. Mm -hmm. But it was all channel. <laughs> Every bit that. of it. Isn't the mind a beautiful thing? It's like, I it wonder is. how I know that. And we pass it off as, oh, I, you know, I just, I must have remembered. I must have got into my research. Yeah. I must have got into my research. That's what we do. We just pass it You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want. We're often running. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain, Awakening Consciousness and Expanding Our Realities. Don't you love all that? Now, I have another beautiful woman to introduce you to, the loveliest girl in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I asked her how I asked her how she wanted to be introduced. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. That was lovely. <laughs> Roberta Grimes. She's an author of one, two, three, four, five, six books, I think now, Roberta. Actually, you're an author of many more than that. But uh, yes, it turns out. Six books that we're going to chat about, you know, we're going to touch on. And uh, she's a researcher into afterlife topics. And Roberta also has her own podcast, radio podcast show, which is called, now you told me, I've forgotten already. It's called Seek Reality. Seek Reality. Love yes, that. Which we all Seek should reality. do. Yeah, expand, expand your mind. I tell you what. Um, so it's morning here in Australia, and I've just had my breakfast, and Roberta's had a long day. It's, uh, it's nice there. Now, where yes. are you, Roberta? You're somewhere in the States. The States seems like such a big place. In Texas. I'm in Texas. Oh, you're in Texas. I speak to a lot of yeah. people in Texas, actually, which is interesting because. You know, there's the Bible Belt down there that you think a lot, a lot of people would be having oh, no. my conversation, but they are down there in Texas, up there. In Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know who decided that you were on the other side of the world and that meant you were down, but I, I think that's highly unfair. You're probably up. We're probably down. Well, who if knows? you turn the globe upside down, we might be absolutely. On the there you go. I don't think there's any up or down in space, so I think that's all <laughs> spurious. That's a great metaphor for life, Roberta. There's no up or down. There's no right or wrong. There's no, you know, we make it all up, don't we? Follow your bliss. That's why I call all my, all my books the fun of something, because everything should be fun or why do it? Well, absolutely. Now let's get into the names. So the books are The Fun of Dying, The Fun of Staying in Touch, The Fun of uh, Growing Forever, 
Liberating Jesus. I think that's the one I want to talk about and my Thomas. And you've actually just re- released another book called The Fun of Living Together, yes. which is about yeah. racial tension that you said, you know, happens in the States. But it's interesting. A lot of people think that I do these shows that only Australians are going to view them. But actually, my audience is far more USA than it is Australia. Yeah, not surprised. Because, because, well, there's far more people in the USA than there is Australia. Yeah. You know, we yeah. have this massive land mass and we have only 22 million people. But oh. the thing about Australia is that there is a lot more conscious people here per capita, you know, per... I think that's true. Yeah. Yes. Sydney is just an incredible city for conscious music and conscious... Oh, it's amazing. It's wonderful. But, you know, the shift since 2012 has been exponential. Isn't it surprising it did start really in 2012? I don't think that's a coincidence, but I don't understand it nonetheless. A wave of consciousness. Waves of consciousness have been happening. Like, it's just exponentially. Look, things things uh, things are rocking it. It's fantastic. But I want to talk about your journey because you're really interesting. You know, you're talking about these afterlife and woo-woo type subjects, but you're talking about it in a, according to you, a very down-to-earth way. And you work as a corporate lawyer, which is a very down-to-earth job. (laughs) I want to explore that a bit, you know, how those two paradigms fit together in one life. But something happened to you when you were a child, which you've said many times, but we'll just go over it and we'll go through a bit of your journey. But when I woke, when I was eight years old, I woke up in the middle of the night and I knew there was no God and I was terrified. And in the middle of my room, there was a flash of light and a voice said, you wouldn't know what it is to have me if you didn't know what it is to be without me. I will never leave you again. So my thought at the time was, oh, isn't that handy? If you forget there's a God, they remind you. And I went back to sleep. But it's in the nature of these experiences that you never forget them. It still feels more than 60 years later as if that just happened. Yeah. And I never asked a question, so I never got an answer. And finally, I realized I had to figure it out myself. So that's what I've been doing for decades. Absolutely. But you know what perplexes me is why you thought there was no God. I mean, what was happening Why you just decided there's no God? Like, what were you thinking? It wasn't what I was thinking. Um, We all have, as you know, um, guides. We all have one primary guide. And then we have guides. Suzanne Wilson, the great medium, says, for a season or a reason, they come and go. Well, my primary guide wanted me to do this work. Mm -hmm. And so when I was eight, he gave me that wake-up call. He was the the voice. He basically just withdrew so I would see the difference. And then he came back. And that's all that was. I mean, if your primary guide suddenly withdraws from your consciousness, you're going to wake up thinking there's no God. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, interesting. Because you had a very Christian and religious upbringing, very Very. different to someone like me, for instance. And I think that maybe, you know, as we discussed that sort of Bible Belt thing in Texas, um, there is a lot of, uh, you know, Christianity and and strong religion here, but I didn't grow up in that sort of society. It was not, yeah, the religious thing. So you were interpreting it as, you know, there is no God. Because as a kid, I always thought there was no God in the way that it was presented to me through religion. It's like none of it made sense to me when people talked about it. But it's it's interesting that you thought there is no God. And that, you know, how do you know me if you don't know me? It was spirit. Spirit withdrew from me. My primary guide withdrew. And that was a difference I could feel. And it was scary. And he came back. He wanted me to see. He wanted me to know there's more. Mm-hmm. And he wanted me then to start start investigating the more. And it was very important to him that I do that. So I did. I mean, he's been, I now understand he's been driving my train my entire life. Most of the decisions I've made, he's driven. He's made yeah. happen. Yeah. So that's just the way it is. That's how it goes. So how did that look when, as a child? I mean, you, I suppose you were just living your life as a child. What else was happening in your mind? Like what other questions were happening? I didn't have questions. Have because questions. that happened, um, and I was living in Massachusetts at the time. I, I, we came to Texas later. But because that happened, I never doubted that there's a God. I became the most zealous Christian you can imagine for okay. 50 years. Mm-hmm. And I read the Bible over and over again, cover to cover. Mm-hmm. I majored in religion, early Christian history specifically, in college. Uh, I was really a serious Christian. 
until the day I couldn't be one anymore. And that was when all this started for me. Because, you know, you're, you're, you're basically trying, you've got two things going on. I was researching the afterlife, trying to understand what had happened to me, and I was reading the Bible every day. I read the Bible cover to cover probably six to eight times, the New Testament twice as many times, and the Gospel so many times I can recite passages by heart. Mm -hmm. And while I'm doing that, I'm doing the research, and I kept trying to find any evidence that what I had believed was a Christ, as a Christian was true, anything, mm -hmm. any of it. Finally, when I was in my early to mid-50s, I had to give up. I knew there was nothing that was true about what I had believed. And I was so bummed by that, that I stopped reading my Bible and I stopped doing research for about two years. I just wanted to forget the whole thing. I mean, could you go to hell for discovering that, there's, that the Christian Bible is wrong? It was very scary. But finally, one day I sort of got up my courage. It was a rainy day and I picked up my gospels. I knew Jesus had said a lot of this stuff, but I didn't want to test him. But then finally one day I said, you know, I kind of know. I got to know what he knew and what he didn't know. Mm -hmm. That was the greatest day of my life because I discovered he had told us things 2,000 years ago about God, reality, death, the afterlife, the meaning and purpose of our lives that we could not have discovered in any way until the 20th century when the dead were telling us the same things. It was incredible. It was basically I proved that day that Jesus was real. He actually had come. Yeah, he came to do something totally different from what Christians believe, but he was real. It was wonderful to find that out. So how did you find that out? Do you just were you were reading what was in the Bible and looking at what people were saying who'd had near death experiences? Is that what you were no, doing? No, nothing to do with near death experiences. So how did you find out that what the dead were saying was the same as Jesus? Um, in the early part of the 20th century and the last part of the 19th century, we got many hundreds of communications through deep trance mediums. And they were much more detailed than anything we get through mental mediums. And amazingly, although some were received in Southern Britain and some were received in New York and some in Boston through deep trance mediums, when they all were talking about the same thing. I say in The Fun of Dying, it's as if you were reading hundreds of accounts of, of, by people who've been, Fiji, been to Fiji for the past 200 years. They all had different experiences, but they were all in Fiji, and it was all consistent with their being in the same place. Mm -hmm. Same process, same description of the, 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 how it looks physically, the same way they dress, the same pastimes, the same you know, judgment or not, the same physics, the same way they travel, the same way they communicate. It was all the same. And so I knew it was real. It was impossible for it not to be real. There was no outlier communication I ever found. So when I compared what I knew from having done decades of that research mm -hmm. with what Jesus was saying in a, in a, I think it was a new, new international version and just in a modern Bible, it was the same. Mm -hmm. And it was impossible for, I mean, little, in little ways it was the same. For example, Jesus talks to the woman at the well. He says to the woman, you know, would you draw me up a, a, a drink of water? And she does. Mm -hmm. And she's, uh, and then she, when she gives it to him, he says, if you, if you had known the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. Now, I know that people think, oh, that's about baptism, but it's not. Say, say that, that again, because it just, it just, alive. we lost you from it. He would have given you what water? What, living water. Living, living water. Living water. And, the, and one of the things they tell us, one of the amazing things, is that the water in the afterlife is very different from what we have here. It looks like water, but it's not wet. You can walk through it and come out of it dry. It feels like silk, and it's alive. It gives off an energy, and it gives off a music. It feels as if it's alive. And he knew that. He knew that. Isn't that amazing? amazing? And what other examples did you find that correlated with what was... Well, he, he talked about the fact that God is spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, I understand he had a handicap. When he was preaching, he couldn't preach against the religion that was prevailing because he would end up with an immediate death sentence. So he had to be sneaky about it. He told parables, little stories. Which he got anyway. He said, <laughs> yeah. He said, he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear after he told the story. Or he would say things in different days when there were different temple guards, of course, following him and they would change. So he would expect his followers to put together the things that he was saying. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he did was to talk about spirit. 
Now, we know that now that God is spirit. There isn't a physical God. There's no, you know, anthropomorphic guy with thunderbolts in his hand, which is what the, the, the people of his day believed. But he, he weaned them gently from that toward thinking of God as loving spirit. And he, he said, for example, you know, don't pray in the synagogues. Instead, go into your inner room and speak to God in secret. And the God who hears in secret will reward you. I mean, all of these are true. Nothing he said was not true. And granted, we're talking two translations, because everything was translated from Greek in, into Greek from Aramaic and then again into English. Mm -hmm. And we're talking 2,000 years, and we're talking something which was, was a folk legend passed down for two generations before anybody wrote it down. So it's amazing anything was preserved that he said. Yeah. And yet... It's all real. It's all true. He told us we're here to learn to love perfectly and to forgive completely. That's true. He told us that if enough of us will do that, we'll bring the kingdom of God on earth. We believe that's also true. All of this was true. He talked about the outer darkness where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That exists. No, hem no fiery hell exists. But the lowest level of the afterlife is cold, smelly, dark, disgusting, and full of demons that are very upset. And those demons are actually people. He, he knew about that. And he knew how you would end up putting yourself there. It was just like reading another communication from a very high-level being who really knew what was going on. And the odds against chance for that are impossible to calculate. Mm -hmm. So that was the greatest day of my life. I proved Jesus is real. So how but, do you see the discrepancy in religion and what you, you, you found with Jesus? There is no anthropomorphic God. There is no fiery hell. There is no devil. There is no judgment by God. But Jesus said that. Mm -hmm. He said, God does not judge you, but he has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that, that, that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. That's in, I think it's John. It's in the Gospels. Nobody reads that. God mm -hmm. doesn't judge us. Jesus says it. And so, oh, but maybe Jesus judges us. So different day, different temple guards. He said, as for me, I judge no one. Mm -hmm. I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Mm -hmm. Now, not to save the world from death, which is what Christians would think, but to save the world from ignorance. From judgment. From the, <laughs> well, just, just, from, just from the fact that they, did, they knew nothing. And when they began to know things, they would be able to progress spiritually much more rapidly. So that's how we came to save the world. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's a, it's, Jesus is real. It's just that Christianity is not. And he had nothing to do with starting it. He even told them not to start it. He said, because he could see what was happening. You see, there was a cult growing up about him as he taught for those three and a half years. So he said, don't put new wine into old wineskins. Because if you do, the wineskins will burst. The wine will make a mess. The wine will run everywhere. Instead, put new wine into new wineskins. Don't package my teachings with the existing religion. Instead, keep them separate. Mm. Follow the teachings. And, you st and then, he, but then he said, both are preserved. You can have your religion if you want it. But package my teachings by themselves. So that's what he, he told us to do, and that's what I do. I tell people, all you need is the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can throw the rest away. Mm. Because that's what he said. I'm trying to follow him. Well, so interesting. The thing, about, the thing about Jesus or Christ, or Yeshua, or Sananda, or whatever you want to call him, Christ consciousness, is he is very present, and it is a, an amazing consciousness that is overseeing our planet. And interestingly enough, when I was a child and had no religious upbringing, if I did hear anything that, that you know, if I went to church for a funeral or a wedding, or actually I went to a Catholic school for a, a little bit, so I had a little bit of it there, I felt that discrepancy, that exactly what you're saying. I felt like I didn't even really believe in any of it because none of it made sense, but I felt like I knew what his teachings were and what I was hearing in the church. I was thinking, he didn't say that. That's not what he meant. I used to argue with it all the time and didn't even think as a kid, why would I know that? Like, why would I know that? I don't study any religion. It doesn't interest me. What interests me was lipstick boys and shoes you know like growing up yeah, the point yeah <laughs> growing up and being you know as the you know carving a career out and having a family and all those things that we're supposed to do and yet I had this argument going on in my head 
Well, he didn't mean that. That's not what he said. And I often used to say, oh, he'd roll in his grave if he heard that, you know, like I often used to say that. So it's interesting hearing your perspective because I've had a similar perspective. And uh, like you, he asked me to clear it up. But there are a lot of people out there now channeling Jesus or clearing up his teachings, I find, you know, on the internet. A lot of people coming out with what he really meant and what his teachings really were because they see that discrepancy inside the religious teachings and what they know. Mm. It's very important to separate Jesus from Christianity now. The reason is simple. We have coming up very soon ex excellent electronic communication with the people we used to think were dead. It's already in beta. It's being done. So they tell us, of course, the dead have no idea of time. They keep say saying he's two years away. But in fact, it's close. It's, I say, five to ten years away. And when anybody has an app on their phone, they can call up dead aunt, great aunt Mildred and ask for her recipes. They know she's alive. They're, then the jig is up. Because one of the first things the dead will tell us is Christianity is wrong. Jesus is right, but Christianity is wrong. And I'm very anxious to get enough people to understand that Jesus is separate from Christianity so they won't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Interesting. Well, that's an interesting message you've got there because I, I get a few comments on the YouTube channels and people that, you know, my girlfriend became a born again Christian when we were very young and I was delving into all sorts of spiritual stuff. I was learning. My, I was discovering my own intuitive abilities and doing all sorts of manner of healing courses. And she was a staunch born again Christian. And we'd have these big arguments about she said, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell, and you're going to burn in eternity. Yeah. And I would say, seriously, Lisa, what about all the Hindus in the world and the Buddhists? I said, not everyone in the world. Do. I mean, are you serious? And she's like, yep, they're going to hell. And that was the argument we used to have. And she was vehemently sticking to her story. And I was vehemently sticking to mine. And we just decided at one stage that we were never going to agree with each other. And we'd, ha we'd take up this conversation when we were dead. That's what we decided. <laughs> It was hilarious. It's but, nothing that they talk about is true. It's really kind of alarming that they're so closed minded. There is no hell. There is no judgment by God at all. Jesus told us that and it's true. The only judgment is by oneself. And it's not really a judgment. It's more of a review of your life, seeing how it went and resolving to do better next time. But um, it's not it's nothing like nothing happens like what Christians believe. God Jesus did not die for our sins. He died for a different purpose. And when you think about it, think how barbaric that belief is. God doesn't love you enough unless he, and to forgive you for Adam's sin, never mind your own, unless he first gets to enjoy Jesus be horribly murdered. Once he gets to see that, they'll, they'll feel better and he can forgive you. What kind of a belief is that? That's crazy and it's insulting to God. And it's humiliating to Jesus. Yeah, it's a controlling belief. Well, you know, here's the thing that um, they all say. It's like, if you don't believe in Jesus, and they all use this line. I remember I went to see this amazing guy speak about his near-death experience. He was, um, he was a doctor, so he explained it in, uh, and I was like a doctor at the time too. I'd done a naturopathic course, and I was very into phys physiology and um, how the body works. And he explained dying very succinctly. It was an amazing experience. But he was a born again Christian and he used this line as well. He said, you only come to the father through me. And that's the excuse they use for everyone. Like no one can be enlightened or come to the father unless through Yes, him. but Jesus was mistranslated because yeah. that, that simply is but not you know, true. You know what he what said he... to me about that? He what? said, who is me? When you say that line, who is me? I don't know. But well, they, they when you do. say me, when you come to the Father through me, who is me? I well, it was Jesus saying Well, that. no. Well, everyone who says that line, me, is me. It's me. It's like you come to the Father through me. You come through yourself. And but that's, what Jesus, that's what he meant. Like, and so, but they've put the me as in Jesus. But, yeah, that's what he said to me anyway. Me is, 
You, but, but what Jesus must have said, he tells us over and over again, we must follow his teachings. He said, and I can read this from the front of the fun of, of liberating Jesus. If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Exactly right. That's John 8, 31 to 32. He says that. Since he emphasized his teachings, we're pretty confident what he actually said was, no one comes to the Father except through my teachings. And that's true. Those teachings or some other teachings that teach you perfect love, that's how you go. Approach the level at which the Godhead is. That's true. But, but the people who first did the, the transcribing and the translations used a shortcut, me. They, to them, it made the same, didn't mean, mean a difference. To us, it makes a huge amount of difference. But you're right. And frankly, Christians are, as Gandhi said, Christians are so unlike Christ. They're, they're totally unlike Christ. And if they were actually following Jesus, that would not be the case. Well, Roberta, let's not put all of them in, in that same basket. I'm sure there's some many Christians out there that are amazing. I would love to meet some. I would love to meet Christians who follow Jesus. I have yet to meet a single one. And I've known I, a lot of them. Oprah had this amazing priest on her show years ago. I can't remember what his name was. And he started this uh, revolution. He created these purple armbands, you know, those plastic bracelets that you buy. And he, he asked his uh, followers, his ch congregation, to stop complaining. And um, he said, I'm going to give you a test. Put this armband on and try for 30 days not to complain. And then... If you don't make it, like if you start complaining, take it off, put it on the other wrist and start again and see if you can reach 30 days. Well, it took off and people started ordering these purple rubber armbands. And he said very few people actually succeeded in not complaining for 30 days. And he said to Oprah that he started manufacturing these armbands by the millions because it took off and people were ordering them. And she said, surely that's costing you a lot of money. And he said something beautiful. He said, I'm not doing it to make money. I'm not doing it to raise money. I'm doing it to raise consciousness. And I loved that because people don't understand that, you know, complaining, judging, all of that lowers your vibration. Yes. Your, your vibration is low when you feel crappy, when you feel like you're, you don't feel great when you're complaining. When you don't feel good, you know that, that the connection to the, to the love or the source or your God or whatever you're seeking, the connection to what you want is diminished. So he was an amazing Christian. <laughs> I don't know what the what else he taught, but that was amazing. I only heard that conversation. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, but I do agree that many of them have misconstrued the teachings and uh, there are many people out there who are trying to get it right. Now, let's get back to your journey because uh, what intrigues me is you're a corporate lawyer and you're still a corporate lawyer while you're delving into all this spiritual work, which I find fascinating. What, 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 why did you become a corporate lawyer? What were you thinking? Well, my guide guided me to become a lawyer. I now understand why it sort of gives me cred. I, have, I, I didn't want to ever practice traditional law, but I soon fell into, I'm per, corporate not precisely, although I work with a lot of corporations. I'm, I, I'm a, a lawyer for the owners of closely held businesses. Um, typically family businesses. I've helped a number of businesses go to the third generation. In one case, I helped a business go from the fourth to the fifth to the sixth generation in Massachusetts. So um, I, the reason I love doing it is that A, it's fun because there's a lot to know and to learn. I mean, it's like a playground for the mind. Every business is different. Every business has issues that are different. But also, I love my clients. I really love them. Yeah, yeah. In some cases, as I say, I've been working with the same family for decades. I'm part of the family. Yeah. So even though I have lived in Austin for the past, I think I've lived out of Massachusetts for almost 15 years, I go back and forth regularly and practice law there because I love them. Yeah, And it's been very helpful. I've seen so many things I've learned from my clients over 35 years. So many things. It's been helpful in my work. I understand people so much better because I've done this work. That's beautiful. Well, a lot of people who, you know, discover a spiritual life and start going down that rabbit hole of consciousness, uh -huh. they, they give up their mainstream job because they think it doesn't fit with who I am now. I'm a new person and this doesn't work anymore. And I love that you're still very much involved in the mainstream. 
and the law, which is something that seems so third dimensional to me. And you're talking very fourth, fifth, sixth dimensional concepts and that you can find that congruency, you know, with your work and your spiritual life. It's beautiful. But it's all love. Mm. When I practice law, it's about love. That's nice. When I'm doing this work, it's about love. It's all about love. So it's really not different. I think if I were doing courtroom law yeah. and being an adversary, it would be different. Yeah. But I've never been in the courtroom as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So it's all sort of contracts and looking at contracts and all that sort of thing. Estate planning, counseling, yeah. contracts, um, policies for the company, strategies for growing. There's so much stuff. I mean, most of what I know, um, other than the straight document stuff, I've learned from my clients. I, when, I, when I started out, I didn't know much, but now I know quite a lot about small business, I have to tell you. Yeah. You taught me. And how do you incorporate what you know about, you know, dead people speaking to you? I mean, does that conversation come up in your normal... Sometimes. I mean, you've got a radio podcast show, so you're out there. It's not like it's your hidden life, you know. You're no. out there. We've got your books. Do, do they know? Do your clients know that you've written all these books and that you're talking about Jesus? The hardest, yeah, the hardest, hardest time was in 2010 when um, the the fun of dying, the first version, came out. I had to tell them, but with all that coming out, I had to tell each of my client companies and you know the head heads of it have them that I had written a book because I was an afterlife researcher and just they should be aware they would the book was out there and I offered to give them the book and. Some of them thought it was great, and they still talk to me about it and about my later books. I, they want to read all the later books. It's great. Then some of them are so buttoned down that they said, oh, well, now about this next clause, they never, they didn't want to know anything, and that's okay. But, but yeah, it's a little, for some people, it seems split personality. But to me, as I say, it's all about love. It's all yeah. love. So love in all its forms is fun. Look, I absolutely agree with you. I have to say I've never been very mainstream. So I've always been the crazy chick, you know, creative, you like pursuing creative pursuits and reading Shirley MacLaine's book when I was like 19 and talking about all those, you know, how Shirley MacLaine was so vilified for her beliefs. Yes. So I've always been vilified. So I'm really used to it. But I love hearing your story of being so you know, pin down sort of corporate law and, and, and then talking about afterlife topics. It's, it's just wonderful because I think that this energy needs to be imbued in everything that it goes on here. That's it can't true. be separate, you know. Like I That's know so that true. you had my favourite Garnet on your show. He's one of my favourites. And the thing that tickled me so much about yeah. Yeah, He's funny, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because he is absolutely serious and straight and yet he's having the most amazing experiences and oh, writing about them. I know. Talk about a corporate guy who went totally off the rails. I know. And, and he said that he couldn't, you know, he... Once, once his spirit guide Albert entered his life, he could no longer be a corporate lawyer. But um, I, I, what really fascinated me was how did your corporate friends cope with your books? Because his books are so out there, you know, they're so wonderful. And they're all true. I mean, so those who had questions asked them. I answered them. I mean, no apologies for the truth. I don't think any of us should apologize for the truth. Mm -hmm. And since they're true, I'm happy to share them, but I don't put them, push them down people's throats if they don't want to know. We don't talk about it. There's one case where I work with two partners, and one of them wants nothing to do with it. It's a very traditional Christian, and the other is fascinated, and I give him all my books. It's fine. But people should never apologize for doing, for working with what's true. I mean, it's our great misfortune as a society that science will not investigate this, yet and they won't investigate it because they're stuck on materialism that's the dogma they adopted a hundred years ago and they're still following it mm -hmm. now anything with a dogma is a religion by definition it's just a belief system so we really don't have a functioning science at this point not until they're willing to look at everything mm. well it's interesting you know through the channeling eric blog uh, elisa medhus was brought up by militant atheists and she her journey was very fast when her son committed suicide. And mm. Eric had said um, she just asked him a million questions through different mediums in the afterlife. You know, when is, when is science going to, when, when is humanity going to get with the picture and stop saying that, you know, all this stuff is not true? And he said the majority of people will wake up through science because as science expands, and the quantum theory is explored more and non-local, -lo you know, consciousness and everything is explored more. It will actually 
science will come to the party. It'll actually start to explain what people have been talking about through spirituality for years. And, and that actually is already doing that. It is but already the doing is, it. If you, it's all, the trouble is scientists are not. I yeah. mean, Max Planck, um, who, was the, who got the 1918 Nobel Prize as the father of quantum mechanics, and Albert Einstein, who needs no introduction, both totally got this stuff, mm -hmm. and they understood what's going on. But even though they said it, and they said what was going on, mainstream scientists cannot investigate any of this, or they risk their careers. And that's true to this day, and it is pathetic. So... Um, we, th those of us doing this research have been able to use quantum physics for dummies, which doesn't include math, to figure out that, yes, that's the physics that's operating in the afterlife or a variant mm. of it. Um, well, we have a glimpse of it. Well more. Yeah, we have a glimpse of it. But that's really how Elisa woke up because she was someone that was no way going to go and speak to a medium. She just thought that anyone that talked about psychic ability was completely off their rocker. But she started looking into quantum science and she, she went down that scientific rabbit hole and then it started putting two and two together and she thought, well, if quantum science is explaining that you can't destroy energy, as you said, Einstein said that, you cannot destroy energy, it only transforms, mm -hmm. then where has Eric gone? He must be still somewhere because he's an energy, right? Just because he's left his body doesn't mean he doesn't exist. So that was her awakening, which was pretty much my awakening too. I didn't come at it through religion. I came at it through um, Deepak Chopra, who again was a scientist that or and a doctor who turned to that spirit and he explained spirituality beautifully and talked about the uh, infinite field of possibility that, you know the quantum field and i thought now that's something i can get not some white guy with a beard sitting on a throne giving orders <laughs> so i love it that's how humanity will awaken through the science which is beautiful so with your books, which one is, would you like to talk about? Oh, I'm going to talk about Thomas. You say that you're not a medium and you're not psychic, but you realize that as you write your books, you're channeling. Yeah, I didn't know that until recently. Um, my primary spirit guide um, is somebody, I mean, it's sort of like driving a car. The car works fine. I don't want to know what's under the hood. And I've known for a long time that I had spirit guides were helping me. I mean, the titles of my books, I wanted to call The Fun of Dying, uh, Dying for Idiots, because I was sure Dying for Dummies was, would be tight somehow, trademarked. And I, my publisher didn't like it, but I, that's what I wanted to call it. And one morning, shortly before it was too late to change the title, I woke up and I had in the, my head three titles, The Fun of Dying, The Fun of Staying in Touch, The Fun of Growing Forever. And I thought, oh, that's a much better title. So we, made, we gave that title to the first book, but I didn't know what the other two would be, but I knew there would be two other books. And uh, uh, then suddenly I realized The Fun of Staying in Touch, of course, that's communication. So that book was written, but I didn't know until after Liberating Jesus was dictated and then and published that um, that would be what the fun of growing forever would be about the how the teachings of Jesus help us grow but two years ago two years ago plus two months now um, Thomas broke into my life through a medium that I thought I was consulting about my family and I was having a lovely time with my family and my primary guide said oh you have your guides here would you like to talk to them I said what the heck this was toward the end of the reading, and I have 11, because I'm very hard to manage. But then my primary guide stepped forward, and that was how I met him. He said that in his next-to-last lifetime, he had been Thomas Jefferson. And then I couldn't see him, but I knew he was rolling his eyes, because I was going, oh, I was such a groupie. I was a groupie for months after I learned this. But and he had to get past that because, of course, he's way over that lifetime. You, would, you and I would never be, but he is. And about, a, let's see, that was February. Three months later, he went to my medium friend and he said, I need to talk to Roberta. So we arranged to, to talk. And that was when he told me I had to write Liberating Jesus. He said in his Jefferson lifetime, he had written a similar book, but it wasn't the right time. Now it is the right time to publish it. And I need to write it. And he gave me compelling reasons why. And anyway, I mean, you know, after everything he had done for me in founding the country, the least I could do was, you know, write his book. So I set out to do it. Apparently, I had refused before because, you know, we consult with our guides at night and he had tried to get me to do it. And I wouldn't do it. But now I did. 
But it, I realized as I was writing it that it's, I write so easily because he's channeling it. He makes me just feel smart and the table of contents just comes right out and then the words start and I just write the whole thing. Then, with, uh, after we had spent a few weeks on it, um, he sees my friend Suzanne again and he said, he, she, she said he actually occupied her body and he said, we apologize that the energy will be much higher because you're working directly for the master without the benefit of filters that would slow the transmission. Please let us know if it overwhelms the physical. And I said, what the heck does that mean? Two o'clock the next morning, I wrote up, I woke up, rushed to my computer and I started, according to Thomas, channeling Jesus. And we wrote that whole book in two weeks. Yeah. And that was very different. That's when I knew that, that's, that I'm not writing any of this stuff. It felt very different than Thomas. Thomas just makes me feel smart. It's a collaboration. But here I was like a word processor. I was doing this. I didn't even, even have, have the time. And it, I'm, I'm typing with my fingers. I'm not, yeah. It's not showing on the screen. But um, periodically, he would make me look about you know, two or three lines back. And I'd read it. And I'd say, oh, that's fine. And go back. No, he'd make... I, then I would see there was a word he wanted me to change. I would change the word. Then we were back to doing this. I couldn't even read it because we were working such long hours for two weeks. When I finally read it, it was so radical. I, I sent Suzanne an email. I said, I will not publish this. This is just too radical. She said, funny you should say that because the unity, which is the group around Jesus, that's what she calls them. They don't think they feel they have a name, um, want to read your book. Send it to me. So I did because I figured, okay, they're going to fix this. And she, she contacted me a few days later, and she said, these are three changes they want. And they were just formatting changes, and they were all good. And I said, great. I said, D emailed back to her, and I said, well, tell me what words to change. They said, the master asks them to tell you, well done and good and faithful servant. So then I cried. I cried because that's such a prominent phrase in the book, and I cried because I have to now publish this. And we published it. I was very reluctant to, but it's actually been very well received. I hear from a lot of people who are reading it and they love it. So, so this is uh, Liberating Jesus. How long ago did you publish it? It was published um, in September of 2015. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do your guides work with you during your daily life? They don't. I mean, only if I'm writing something, they are the ones who give me you know, they say, you've got to write this, you've got to write that. And I do it. And it, if I try to run on my own, I can't. So I've accepted that. But charitably, they do have, they have given me fiction guides. The head fiction guide I have is Marvina. And they let me write fiction too, because that's so relaxing. I enjoy it. But primarily, they make me write nonfiction. They're shaking their heads at you, Roberta, and they're saying, <laughs> oh, Roberta, we are with you, and we are inspiring you all the time. It's that I'm sure they are, but I'm not aware of it. I don't hear them talking. They pops up their chest and says, this is me, this is me, this is me. But they say, we're with you all the time, inspiring you, inspiring oh, you. I, I, I do inspired. know that, that that's true, but I, it doesn't, it's not something I can hear consciously. I'm, I'm aware of Thomas. He's always standing now by my left shoulder and I'm aware of very aware of him but and I sometimes get a sense of when he's happy or unhappy with what's going on but I never he never chats so you know so it's what they're saying to me and um you know because we had a bit of a chat yesterday and I wrote you an email and said after our connection they were like on my case and I didn't you know I sent you an email but I didn't tell you the half of what they were telling me oh dear but, <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you now <laughs> Thanks a lot. No, I'm going to tell you some of it. <laughs> no, I've completely lost it. Oh, okay. That's it. Um, they say, yeah, you don't hear us, but you feel us. And it's in that you. feeling. So it's like when you're talking, and I say this for the benefit of everyone that's watching too, that is because uh, I'm actually about to do a course, an online course called, you know, connecting to your spirit guides. It's actually in that feeling where you start talking because you've worked something out in your head. And then as you keep talking, you get this feeling of like those aha moments, like, oh, right, that makes so much sense. Oh, yes, this sounds right. And it's in this feeling that as you speak, and you've had that so many times, and then you sort of, after you've spoken, you think, gee, I'm so clever. 
I'm just so clever. You know, I figured that out on the, you know, and, and that's them. You know, I, I, I know I'm doing nothing on my yes. own. It, it's, yes. I, I'm an avatar. Thomas is not in body and he needs an avatar and that's who I am. It's, you know, it's what, we're all, we're we're all avatars. But he is. What? All of us are avatars. Every single being. We're all, a, you know, we're all infinite intelligence inhabiting a human avatar which has this beautiful mind and ego that really dumbs us down. But all of us, when we reemerge, uh, have access to all that is, if we want. Oh, sure. But, yeah, so, we have to go back and we merge with our mind. All of us are avatars. It's just that we... But I'm Thomas's avatar. I'm really not Roberta's avatar. Not anymore. I've given him my life, and I'm just doing what he wants me to do. And I'm very happy with that. I'm, I'm much happier doing his work than doing anything I would think of myself. So what else has he got on the, you know, table for you, like on the drawing board? Okay, Roberta, this is what's up next. Well, we, we are working on a children's book, which is going to be beautiful. I've had a number of requests from people who've read Liberating Jesus saying, do you have a book like this for children? So we're doing um, a picture book, which will be out probably in the fall because the pictures are taking a long time. But it's, it's just about children meeting Jesus in the woods. It's called The Fun of Meeting Jesus. And uh, they're talking to him, and he's telling them things from the Bible. And the pictures, are, as I say, are beautiful. Um, also, I'm writing, and probably it'll be out by June, well, July, um, The Fun of Loving Jesus. I was sitting having lunch with someone one day, and all of a sudden the title was in my head, The Fun of Loving Jesus. And I said, oh, no, I think there's another fun book coming. But I don't like the title. I, I, I fight a lot of these titles. But as I started assembling it, because I was getting the download of the table of contents, and I, it's been downloaded, except it's been interrupted because I've had to do so much for the fun of living together that it's sort of been, uh, I've been interrupted. But I'll finish it soon. And the more I write it, the more I realize, yeah, if you, if you bred liberating Jesus with the fun of living forever, what you'd get would be the fun of loving Jesus. It's about what Jesus came to do and the, the movement he came to start. Because people ask me now, okay, I see Christianity is going down, and many people will not mourn that loss. They don't like those teachings anyway. They love Jesus. But they say, what comes next? And I've, I've been saying, I don't know. I have no idea. But I've come to think that since we're really the ones who are following Jesus, not the so-called, what Jesus calls the so-called, I mean, Thomas calls the so-called Christians, we deserve the name Christian. But we're, but we're sort of genuine Christians. So what I'm coming to understand, and through Thomas, is that there will be a Christianity that survives, but it won't look anything like what people now follow. It will follow the teachings of Jesus strictly. And this book is about what that will look like, how, what it will be, and why. So you're going to give a copy to the Pope? <laughs> He'd love it! <laughs> No. See, I, I mean, I don't confront anyone. People should believe what makes them happy. I'm sort of just waiting to, to when, as people one by, one by one become disillusioned, and especially as they start hearing from their relatives that the religion is false, I'm just going to, I want to have there be an alternative, or I think Thomas is the one who wants there to be an alternative. So they'll still follow Jesus, but they won't have to follow those awful teachings. Yeah. Well, you've got your work cut out for you, darling one. That's all I can. I love it. <laughs> I have yeah. to say, I, I never have religious sort of conversations on my show. So this is like a first. Um, yeah, many of the people that I speak to have at one time been Catholic, brought up Catholic, strict, but they've, they've turned their back on it because it, none of it made sense to them. And, uh, and they can. People should do yeah. whatever feels right to them. But there are many people who love Jesus, but they just can't handle the teachings anymore. And so it's for them that this book is written. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, you know, I have a, a many Jewish friends here in Sydney, and uh, there is a movement here called Jews for Jesus. I love it. I'm sure it's They'll a They'll love this book. Yes. Uh, I'm sure it's a global phenomenon. I'm sure it's just not in It is. But, it is. Uh, yeah. Being someone that never felt connected to any religion, I, I just looked at all of them and I sort of queried people and, you know, why don't you believe in Jesus and what's all that about? But coming from a, like an investigative mind, uh, not someone that, um, you know, wanted to join their faith, but just like, help me understand how this works, you know, and uh, it's interesting. 
I've got friends that practice their Judaism and they're very spiritual and, and yet they sort of use all those, um, you know, uh, what am I, those rituals, you know, the Jewish rituals to get married and have babies and do all that sort of stuff. And um, it's interesting, the whole religion versus spirituality thing, because again, there seems to be some battle there between new age sort of concepts and religious. Here's the reality. No religion is, is spiritual. They're all, every way of religion I've ever looked at is based in fear. Otherwise, people won't keep practicing it if they're not afraid not to. In point of fact, they'll stay in bed on Sunday mornings and you can't have that. Christianity is deeply based in fear. And fear is the opposite of love. And we're here to learn how to love. So as long as people are in religions, they really can't grow spiritually. Not very much. So if by, by freeing people, by freeing Christians from the fear and giving them only the love, they can grow very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Those teachings are right. They're the, the teachings of Jesus are the easiest short course in spiritual growth I've ever seen. Well, uh, there would be, because I have a lot of friends who, you know, practice Hinduism or that sort of different forms of it. They're all good. Yeah. yeah. This is just quicker. For, for Westerners anyway, it's quicker. Yeah, they all say their road is quicker. It's interesting. I just say to people, whatever floats your boat, whatever turns you on. Absolutely. Whatever Absolutely. you're attracted to, something whatever feels good to you. Because I speak to lots of people who, you know, chant mantras. I go to Kirtan most weeks and chant, uh, you know, Hindu mantras and, and uh, the name of God in Hindu because I'm not attached to any of it, but I can take, I can take bits of it, the bits that I like from any religion and, and play with it and enjoy it. You know, I used to be married to a Hare Krishna. And in the book's Conversation with God, Neil Donald Walsh, or God, says exactly what you've just said. All religion is based in fear. And he read that and he came to me and he said, well, what do you think about this? And I said, something to think about because I didn't want to give him my opinion. I just wanted him to explore for himself as I had explored. And he said, I would agree with that, except for my religion. My religion is definitely not based in fear. And then one time we went to the temple here in Sydney and they were doing all their rituals, a bit like the Christians do. The kids were dressing up and doing plays and they were cooking their food. And he had this, um, I, he was sitting on a chair watching a play and I walked up to him. I was having a lovely time talking to people and eating the beautiful vegetarian food. And everyone was dressed up in Indian gear. And he said, we have to go. And he was really angry. And he drove home angry and we got home angry. And I said, what is going on with you? And he said, Karen, everything you witnessed, all of it, all of it is based in fear. He said he just had this epiphany as he was partaking in their rituals. He yeah. said, if you don't eat this food, you're going to go to hell. If you don't say the mantra right, you'll go to hell. If you don't That's, right. That's the problem. That's what yeah. they're all like. But the reason I say that the teachings of Jesus are the easiest for Westerners is that you don't have to meditate. You don't have to chant. You don't have to do yoga. You don't have to memorize anything. You don't have to follow a guru. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to do any of those things. And it takes, if you do it seriously, the, the program that Jesus gave us takes three to four months, and then you never have to even worry about it again. Your life is different and different forever. That's what I, I'm amazed at how fast it works. But I think for Westerners, because we don't want to meditate or chant or do any of that other stuff. We want to just go about our lives. And that the teachers of Jesus will do that. Meditating and chanting has been one of the best things that I've ever done in my life. I love it. Not for me. <laughs> I mean, we're all different. Whatever floats your boat is what's good. You know, it's interesting, meditation was really a vehicle to get in contact with my guidance because that was something that was very important to me to um, have, that, um, have that psychic awareness and use that in my daily life. And meditation was really the vehicle to get me there, to quieten down that chatting mind so that I could hear them. I could hear them, see them, feel them, smell them, all of it. And um, it's been a beautiful journey. Meditation is such a beautiful journey. And and I was actually exploring a lot of healing modalities. That's what got me on this path. And I saw that people were overcoming illnesses through meditation. I went mm -hmm. to see John of God in Brazil and he has this big room full of people meditating. He said it creates this current. And people were being healed just sitting in that meditation, sitting there, just sitting in that vibration, that energy. So meditation, I think, is a really important, really important part of this journey for most people. And a lot of people hate it. 
because they just can't, you know, because their mind can't. I've tried. My husband's been doing it for 40 years or something. I tried. I just, I just I don't like to interrupt my day for it. I feel it's <laughs> controlling me. And I don't, I can't get into a zone where it feels I'm really doing anything differently. So <laughs> to heck with it. I just followed Jesus. You don't have to do that now. I love it. I love it. All right. Let's talk about your show before we finish, because you've been doing your fabulous show and speaking to some fantastic people. Who's been someone that's really uh, enlightened you? Like one of your favorites, or I shouldn't call them favorites, but I have many favorites. I mean, I introduce, I, because it's called Seek Reality, we cover a broad range of people. I've had Garnet on two or three times, for yeah, example, Garnet too. Schillhauser. I love him. Um, I've had uh, Gary Schwartz on, who is the, the foremost scientist working on communicating with the dead. And they're going to have some real breakthroughs. It's very exciting work being done in his laboratory. And he's been on a few times. Um, R. Craig Hogan, the author of Your Eternal Self, who to me is one of the most advanced beings I've ever known in a body. Um, Suzanne Wilson is um, the the most advanced medium I have ever known. She is incredibly accurate as an evidential medium. She's been on a few times, and she has a new book out called Soul Smart. So she'll be on again in a few weeks. Um, just oh, uh, Jamie Turndorf, who with her husband, um, he was he was a, a, a Jesuit priest, and then he died. And now, basically, whenever you have lunch with Jamie, he's there too. <laughs> He's, doing, he's talking and he's doing all that stuff. That's fun. Um, the Zamets, Victor and Wendy Zamet, who are your neighbors, yeah. have been so on a number say, of times. When you say he died, he's there too. He's there through who? He talks with, through his wife. Through his wife. Oh, okay. Well, so when you have lunch with his wife. Yeah. I have lunch with her and he's always making comments. She said, oh, this is what he just said. And then we're laughing with him because mm -hmm. he's, he's funny. He keeps making jokes and she is not like that. She's pretty serious. Yeah, yeah. So Circle, uh, all kinds of people. So it's so um, interesting that you say you want to meditate because you know Lisa Methus is the same. She's she's interviewing all these mediums and she's having these amazing conversations, but she can't meditate because she can't still the mind and she finds it frustrating and she hates it. And yet she wants that same communication that all those mediums have with her son. She wants that with her son. And I don't see. I'm content with that. Mm. Every two months, Suzanne will give me a free reading. Um, her idea with Thomas, I, actually it's probably his idea, she just lets me know when we're going to be talking and then he gives me direction through her. And that's fine. Mm. I mean, the rest of the time, he, he does dictate the books. He clearly, I've never fussed over a table of contents. I hear the, the title of the book and then I start writing the table of contents and it never changes. So that's how I know I'm not doing it. I didn't make that up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we start right at the introduction and we go right through the end and I, I virtually never have to edit what comes out. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm rational. I know that's not me. And that's <laughs> it's just good that he chose me. I'm so glad he chose me to do this. He tells me we've had 17 lifetimes together. Mm -hmm. And he says, we, because I'm so in awe of the fact that he was Thomas Jefferson. He said, look, I've had more important lifetimes than that. And you've had more important lifetimes than that. So just get over it. He doesn't say get over it, but that's kind of what he says. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was a Jefferson groupie long before I ever met my, my guide. Mm -hmm. I just think it's wonderful. I wrote a book called My Thomas about his marriage, which spanned the Revolutionary War. And I think it's the best thing I'll ever write. Only much later did I find out that was channeled too. So that book, My Thomas, oh, I see. So you wrote that when you didn't realize you were channeling. No, I, I wrote the first draft in like 1990. And he tells me now that, that he, he, Thomas, uh, I mean, uh, Jesus led the group that did A Course in Miracles. They thought, okay, uh, this is going to be a restatement of the Gospels because he's been trying to fix Christianity for a long time. Yeah. So he wrote A Course in I Miracles, know. the group the group did. And uh, then it quickly, we, they realized it went right over everybody's head. It's very valuable, but very few people can do it. Yeah. So then he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a new revelation that's exactly the same as my old revelation. And that was decided in the 80s. And they, he wanted someone who had never, you know, wasn't a channel, had never, was not known to be a channel. So Thomas, bless his little heart, recommended me. And, but they didn't know if I could channel because I hadn't started working with Thomas yet. So he guided me through researching that book and writing that book, which to me is astonishing. Here's a man who was so private, he burned all his wife's letters. He never wrote a personal memoir. 
So then, you know, 100 years after he dies, he um, writes a memoir through me. But that's what it is. It's Tom, my Thomas is a memoir of Thomas Jefferson's life during the Revolutionary War. It's the best thing I'll ever write because I didn't write it. And it's very good. Mm. So when you were writing at the time, you were researching him and you just thought the information you were putting in was Judaism. Yes, I, but I realized in retrospect that was stupid. But I mean, I sat down at the typewriter because our computer was a much more primitive computer then. And um, the words just started flowing. Mm -hmm. And I very, I mean, the scenes, it all came to life. And I, can, and I would look at what I, I wonder where, how I knew that. Oh, I'm sure I got it out of my research. And I would just keep going. Mm -hmm. But it was all channeled. <laughs> Every bit of it. Isn't the mind a beautiful thing? It's like, I it wonder is. how I know that. And we pass it off as, oh, I, you know, I just, I must have remembered. I must have got into my research. Yeah. I must really have got into my research. That's what we do. We just pass off. You know, here's the thing, Roberta. Look, I'm a teacher of this, so I, I'm harping on it because I really believe that when all of us tune into our guidance, we'll be, society, life on earth will be a lot better because, you know, our guidance is love whether you call it Jesus or Thomas or your higher self or your angels, it's all love. As you say, it all, the communication is all love. And when you tune into your own inner being or higher self or angels or guides or whatever, I call yeah. my mob the mob because there's just thousands of them. They're just too numerous to mention. So I just call them the mob. Um, you, you become a much more generous, kinder, person you, you realize that you're actually not working as a singular being that it's all about you and your life you actually everybody's part of a team that we're you all connected and what i do for you i do for me and vice versa you you, you really understand the oneness of being when you tune into it and uh, so i'm very passionate about people tuning into their guidance more because it's the best guidance you can get happy. you can go to mediums but you know the best the person that knows you so completely that sees your whole life from a broader perspective as that is that team is that mob and so they're the best people to speak to and um to have that telephone you know in your head like that co constant communication is the best way to live your life i find it exhilarating and beautiful i, I just love knowing that i'm working with people who are trying desperately to fix the world and now say they will succeed and I'm doing my own little, little tiny part for, for just being guided by them. It makes you so happy to be in this zone. It really does. Mm. There's no joy like it. And especially, you know, I'm old. And to be old and oh, to darling, find... you're not old. You're oh, yes. Oh, please. I love being old. I'm closer <laughs> to getting to go home. So I'm delighted to be old. So you're about, what, 58? Aren't you a love? <laughs> I just love you. <laughs> I'm 70. No would, way. Wow, you look amazing. 71 this year. Wow, <laughs> Roberta, that really, wow. I tell you what, that's a testament to this spiritual work. You know, do spiritual work and you'll look younger. <laughs> I guess, but I don't even care. I mean, I just, to be able to do this at a time when many people are rocking in a chair is a wonderful thing. I travel, I speak, I have a boundless energy, but the energy comes from the joy of doing this work. Definitely. Definitely, absolutely, definitely. Look, I just want to say one thing because they keep harping on about it. And I don't like what I keep, you know, I edit a lot of what I say because I've got them constantly talking and I'm Thank like, you I'm, for not that. Gonna that. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Little <laughs> blessings. I appreciate that. You appreciate me editing what I say. Yes. <laughs> but we yes. were talking about the crucifixion before. And this is the, uh, this is what uh, Sananda, I call him Sananda, says to me. He said that, you know, the crucifixion, I think that the religion said, I died for your sins, or they've sort of painted it in this way. He said, I wanted to prove to you how when you're connected to your source or connected to God, nothing pisses you off. Because I think the thing that pisses us off more than anything is when somebody says, you're wrong, right? And then when somebody says, I'm going to make you so wrong that I'm going to take you to court and prove that you're wrong, then I'm going to make you so wrong that I'm going to take you to court and then sentence you to death because you're wrong, right? And that's exactly what happened to him. And he said, they made me wrong. They took me to court. They even strung me up and they still didn't piss me off. <laughs> I just thought no, that was it's, 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 <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it's, um, my understanding was that when he came into that life, it, was, it wasn't even part of his plan that he would have a public death. But 
he, he was trying to help these first century primitives understand that human life is eternal. And they knew better. They saw people die and rot and they knew better. So he had to demonstrate it. Mm. So he did. Big, horrible public death. Three days later, ta-da! <laughs> I didn't die and neither will you. Mm. And that's what my understanding was of why he did it. Um, but the point is, there was no need for him. Jesus, God does never judges us. That all came from first century Judaism. Christianity as it's practiced now is a first century Jewish sect. That's what it is. And we have basically not allowed God to give us new revelation for the past 1700 years. The Council of Nicaea in 325 put together the Bible in, the, in, in basically in backroom deals, people say that was God's word. That's hogwash. You can't read the Bible cover to cover and possibly believe that it's the work of an eternally consistent, rational God, impossible, or loving God. You can't believe that if you read the whole Bible. But that's it. That's the last word that Christians are allowing God to have. Now, who are they to say that God cannot give us new revelation, which is what's happening now? God is giving us new revelation. And abundantly. And more and more people are noticing that. Mm -hmm. Roberta, it's been so beautiful to talk with you today. It's what lovely would, to talk with you, dear. What would be the last thing you'd like to leave people? Leave with Please you? know that you are a powerful, eternal being. You never began. You never will end. And when you understand how perfectly you are loved, infinitely, you are God's best beloved child. When you really get that, your life will change completely. Roberta Grimes, thank you so much for talking with us today. On next thank episode. you for having me, dear. Big hug. And I'll put the links to your website underneath the YouTube video, or you can go to karenswain.com slash Roberta Grimes, and you'll see everything you need to know about Roberta there. Thank you, sweetie. Bye for now. Lots of love. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining me for another show, Accentuating the Positive. Wasn't Roberta fantastic? If you'd like to join us in the Inner Sanctum, we put on monthly webinars where you can get to meet some of the people that I interview on Accentuate the Positive. We talk about deliberate creation, how to flow your energy, how to be the creator of your own existence. I really do them to activate and support the difference makers, all the new world teachers, people who feel like they're here to make a difference in humanity and maybe they don't exactly know how to go about doing that. I support and activate and help the New World Teachers and the Difference Makers. So join us online at karenswain.com slash inner sanctum. It's only $22 Australian dollars per month. It gives you access to me. You can ask questions and to some of my guests each month. Also, I put on webinars exploring things like connecting to your spirit guides and other things. You get access to that as well when you join the Inner Sanctum. Or if you'd like a reading, book a reading with me and we can connect you to your guides. We'll look at some of your subconscious beliefs that have you feeling like you can't do what you've come here to do and teach you how to be a genius, a deliberate creator. Thanks again for watching. Bye for now. Thanks so much for joining us for another enlightened conversation on Accentuate the Positive. If you would like spiritual guidance from my guides, Blissful Beings, go to karenswain.com for a reading or to listen to more enlightened thought leaders share their wisdom. Go to the listen page on karenswain.com and choose who you want to listen to. All the podcasts are also available on iTunes. Remember to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, you name it, we're there. Until next time, bye for now. If you feel like that's what you want to do.